Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we have a special standalone episode on the 1972 Alfred Hitchcock film Frenzy. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it. So, warning, spoilers ahead. Also, we have a special warning for this episode. Some of the plot elements could be extremely disturbing for some listeners, including, and this is not a complete list, including torture, murder, sexual assault, on and on so consider yourself warned if those are things you don't want to hear about then move on back to our our fantastic episode on the uh the mushroom people from denver colorado i'm your host jason henderson co-author of california tiki coming this august from the history press with me from austin is tony salvaggio tech director at rooster Teeth studios lead singer and bassist to the band deserts of mars and lead guitarist of the band rise from fire say hello tony howdy howdy also in Austin is Mr. Drew Edwards, editor-in-chief of HorrorMovies.net, <coughs> writer of Online, and creator and writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man. Say hello, Drew. I'm going to try and muster up my best Hitchcock impression. Hold on here. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. And finally, also in Denver, as always, color commentary from attorney Julia Guzman of Guzman Immigration of Denver. She's also a member of the Improv Acapella Vocal Group in Harmony's Way. Say hello, Julia. Hello. Hello. Okay. Frenzy. Uh, Frenzy is a 1972 British thriller film directed by Alfred Hitchcock. It is the second <laughs> to the last film of his career. The screenplay is by Anthony Schaefer. It's based on the novel Goodbye Piccadilly, Farewell Leicester Square. Uh, it stars John Finch, who was the star of Roman Polanski's Macbeth, and Barry Foster as who we very quickly find out is the real killer, because this is not a whodunit. This is just a, this is a suspense film. The plot is about a serial killer in contemporary London and the ex-RAF serviceman who is implicated in the serial killer's murders. In a very early scene, there is a dialogue that matches two actual London serial murder cases, the Christie murders in the 50s and the Jack the Ripper murders. Um, Frenzy was the third and final film that Hitchcock made in Britain after he moved to Hollywood in 1939. He did some early ones before the war. The other two were Under Capricorn and Stage Fright. Uh, and so this was Hitchcock's big return to Britain. And I've said enough. That's, uh, that's enough to get us started talking about Frenzy, uh, other than it did show at, at Cannes. And so, Julia, this was your choice. We're going through a period here where we're having people bring movies for the rest of us to discuss, which is why we did The Attack of the Mushroom People. Uh, Julia, this one was yours. So why don't you kick us off with your opening thoughts on 1972's Frenzy by Alfred Hitchcock. Well, I hadn't seen this film. I just, I really love Alfred Hitchcock. And so uh, I looked in to see what we hadn't covered yet on the podcast. And I just did a list of great <coughs> Alfred Hitchcock films. And this one was one that I had not uh, even heard of. So I was excited to try it out. Um, it's an excellent film. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, but, of course, as you said in the warning at the beginning, it's very disturbing. And it certainly, I don't know that we would have made it the same or that they would have made it the same way if they did it now. And I'm not necessarily sure that that means it shouldn't have been made the way it was because it's reflective of the times. But, like, there are certain things that are disturbing, a la, you know, Law & Order SUV, where they're like... Wait, S yeah, SUV. SUV? S -S -V -U. Special S -V -U. Victims Unit you're talking special about? Special Victims yes. I always say SUV because it's, that's what comes yeah, rolls off my sure. Special Victims Unit, S -S -V -U. Yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of disturbing things that are um, of that nature. So, yes, you have the normal. You don't have you to know, be shy. You, you can talk about what happens in the no, movie. No, 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 I will. I will. I'm not. The, um, I'm just yeah. saying. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, okay. No, I was just saying that. Um, there's a lot of things that are the more violent, you know, rape and asphyxiation, all that kind of stuff. Well, we'll um, ch you know, strangling rather. But there's also comments that are just kind of off the cuff that are yeah. offensive. We'll, we'll get to that more specifically later that don't really 
I mean, they're just kind of in there as, oh, this guy's a jerk, but he doesn't <laughs> face consequences, and there's not, it doesn't seem to be as horrible. Like, nowadays, if you threw something in, that, in there like that, that guy's going to probably get killed or at least have some kind of consequence because he's really bad. And here it's just, oh, this is the, the sexual mores that we're dealing with at this time. So, um, you know, it's very interesting, but gosh, there's some really neat things that are just so special that I'm really looking forward to talking about, but just specifically Alfred Hitchcock. Wonderful. Uh, that that actually kicks it off and left it left us with some some tantalizing, uh, you know, it, like like you described a couple of things there that we're going to get to and, and get into deeper detail. Uh, Drew, so what about you? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Have you seen this before? This is the second time I've seen this. Um, the first time I saw it at the Inwood Theater, in, or maybe in the Lakewood, I actually think it was at the Lakewood Theater in Dallas, um, which they had had like a Alfred Hitchcock festival. Mm-hmm. And I saw this, the movie, and I really remembered a lot about like the dialogue because a lot of it has like Hitchcock sort of macabre humor about mm-hmm. it. And I remembered the potato truck sequence very vivid, vividly. I did not remember how horrific and terrible that the um, the rape and and murder sequence that is in this movie um, was. And I don't know how I could have possibly blotted that out of my mind. Maybe it's just because I was younger and don't have the sensibilities that I now have as as a as a, an, an adult. But mm-hmm. I, my God, I mean that that is it's 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 psycho without the shower curtain. You mm-hmm. know, that's that's it's it's it, and it's it, this it makes it a very odd movie because it has so much of like the Hitchcock <coughs> flourishes, but but Hitchcock to me, you know, the the horror aspects of Hitchcock and you know like like because all even even Hitchcock's non horror genre movies dabble with with horror themes, and this is definitely kind of a genre <laughs> mashup that way. But mm-hmm. this this has this has kind of the sensibilities of a more garish and ghoulish early 70s slasher movie mixed up with like the sort of more quaint and classy stuff I associate with like prime era Hitchcock yeah. and it makes it a weird brew and you know because like that murder sequence and we'll get more into it is legitimately unpleasant to watch and yeah. and possibly one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen in a movie. But um, the rest of the movie is excellent. The acting is excellent, and the the killer, although very similar to Norman Bates, you know Hitchcock's other famous serial killer, is very different in in a way. And I, I you know I'm, I'm looking forward to actually talking about him as a as a character. Yeah. But I, I did enjoy the movie. I I, I I I would recommend people watch it, but I definitely would say trigger warnings abound because. This is a yeah. deeply disturbing film. Um, yeah, no, that, that's that's wonderful. And uh, Tony, what what would you what would you add to that? Oh, I mean, yeah, it's pretty disturbing in a lot of parts uh, that I hadn't anticipated. It's it was strange to me to see something like this that you know Hitchcock is usually a little bit more above the board, mm-hmm. um, a little bit more subdued. Um, the suspense parts are definitely Hitchcock. Yeah. And, uh, also, everybody in this, this is like peak British. Yeah. Everybody in it is so incredibly British in all <laughs> manner that it was really <laughs> awesome to see. Like, just the way everybody handles things is different than you might see in an American crime film of a similar nature. And that's really interesting. By the way, I have to apologize Um if anybody hears like coughing in the background or anything, I'm going to try to mute where I can. Um, yeah, poor Tony's dying of of this Aww. cold or whatever it is. I'm so sorry. Yeah, just the con- the consumption. I, I thought I had muted. I thought my mute was working and evidently I'm told it wasn't. So I hopefully I didn't interrupt people too badly. I, I oh, no, definitely you're, you're, apologize. You're, um, you're right. Yeah, but I, I really, I enjoyed the film Sans. I could have probably done without it being as graphic as it, gets um but all of the very much hitchcock parts are extremely effective and i'm sure we'll get into a couple of them that um a lot of the chases there's one great scene on a truck that's just 
amazing um yeah it's it's you know a tough film in many parts but still a worthy hitchcock film to to check out um if you can get past the really gruesome nature of the initial murder especially i think we should we should start off our conversation with the the question of the the violence in the movie you got, i i agree with you there are a couple of other things i think there's an interesting main character which is the guy who we're asked to follow closely as he's a- accused and gets more and more screwed by the evidence, you know, as these serial killings are going on. There's the serial killer himself. There's the detective inspector uh, or the chief inspector Oxford, <laughs> so-called, who who is investigating the murders and his sort of funny ongoing conversations with the wife. But I think if you asked people who had seen Frenzy and had a memory of it, what do you remember about this movie? The first thing is the extraordinarily vi- extraordinary violence, which I think is very relevant in our recent conversations about violence uh, against women. So uh, I, I want to talk about that because you all alluded to it. It's clearly the thing that, that when you close your eyes and you think about frenzy pops into our head first. Uh, so where, where do we start? I mean, okay, well, let me, let me pose this statement as a question to you. And, and Julia, you can, you can start with the response. I never saw this movie until yesterday, but I've read many essays, and I mean going back to the 1980s, where people said, this movie is appalling, Alfred Hitchcock is taking entirely too much delight. In other words, people will imagine a certain amount of sadism in the movie on Hitchcock's part. You know, it's immoral for us to watch somebody get murdered like this, uh, you know, and the sky's the limit. It makes us bad people, whatever you want to say about it. Um, what, What do we make of that? In other words, can there be a place in our lives for uh, what, in this case, by the way, just to describe it, is a vicious rape and murder of a woman who Kitchcock's been careful along the way to make us like. We've already seen her for several scenes. We like her. So by the time she dies, it's a terrible thing to happen. Um, Is it immoral for it to be done this way? Uh, Well, I mean, maybe, but it's still done that way. Like, we, we often, I think, portray sexual violence in a in a titillating kind of way and i mean i'd say that part of the reason why we still have uh, some shows like you know the svu show or movies where people are raped and and or tortured or for that matter actual snuff films and and violent um pornography i mean heck you know 50 shades of gray is uh, to some extent the fantasy of people being you know hurt and tied up and whatever those things are all part of the dark side of our fantasy lives in many cases and so i think yeah you watch a film like this and there's going to be a certain portion of the population that gets titillated and excited by it and others who are just disturbed and some who are a little bit of both um i just think that's what it is and I, I don't know that if we just decided let's never portray any of this again that that would necessarily go away you know in, in society um this movie you know it's hard for me to know anymore when nudity is gratuitous and when it's not i mean this is the first time alfred hitchcock chooses to have nudity in his films so um i don't think for i'm sure for him it was a tough decision maybe or maybe it was just the first time he was able to because get past the censors i don't know but he it opens with the first body that we see is um is a naked body but they don't we don't see her um the front, the front we just see her back yeah. but she's floating in the in the thames and then you have the um the ex-wife of the main character blaney blaney is his name uh, yes that's right, yeah blaney. she is um Right, she is is murdered, and it's really horrible and awful to watch. There is nothing titillating about that particular scene. I didn't feel like, even though her breast is showing, it was not a um, it was not sexual in any way. Even though he rapes her, there wasn't anything yeah. about it that was exciting. Do you think but, it's intended to be? Uh, I, I didn't actually get that it's intended to be titillating. I mean, uh, I, I, although I'm saying I... anytime you have a rape and uh, rapes in 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 films to somebody it's titillating um but what i did want to mention at this point the thing that i was talking about alluding to earlier which is that when some people are talking in in the in a pub about these murders the this woman it's the woman who is the barkeep whatever she is she's actually the one who says aren't they raped first when this um he's called the necktie 
killer yeah. because he kill, strangles them with necktie. She's like, aren't they rape first? She actually looks excited by that concept. And this creepy old guy who's obviously wealthy because he's got a good suit on. He's talking to another guy with a good suit on. So, and is it, is it actually our serial killer that he's talking to at that point? No, no. The, or, the guy who is going to be suspected is in the background, but he's not listening to their conversation. No, I don't mean that. I mean, is, are the two rich dudes no, one of them? R- Ruskin, no, okay. neither of them is the okay, serial okay. killer. Well, anyway, so, yeah, so the, so the um, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, he rapes and there's a, you know, there's like a silver lining to everything or something. He makes it like, well, that part's good. Like, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. And then she's like, oh, you're bad. And she kind of giggles and walks away. And I'm thinking, okay, so that guy has just been marked as a bad dude. I'm wondering what will happen to him. Nothing happens <laughs> to him. He just Nothing. goes on being just well, a creep but, and it's just characteristic of creeps at the time i guess and i'm sure yeah, that it's, creeps it's yeah, rich, rich creeps <laughs> that, yes. that sort of karmic horror universe thing the logic of that didn't quite exist until like the late 70s early 80s in cinema it was still kind of <clears throat> it's stuck in comic books you know like they didn't you know like you i but i think with that bit of dialogue, Hitchcock's just kind of, I don't know whether or not he's judging society by having this conversation, but I think he is kind of trying to show how people make small talk and trivialize real life horrific events, which of course I've just seen a lot of going on with what we had going on here in in Austin, you know, people do, you know, trivialize and make jokes that are inappropriate. Uh And, you know, like, like, it is it is a very honest look at the way humans react to this sort of thing sometimes because I think that you know making a joke out of it is really the only way we can kind of compute these actions in our brain. Yeah. And you know I guess I guess if I were to try to put you know any kind of thoughts in Hitchcock's head, which is probably impossible, but <laughs> I I think he's he might have been not necessarily thinks that their conversation is funny, but the fact that these sort of conversations happen, yes. I think he probably thinks that's kind of darkly funny. And well, it's, mm-hmm. also, it's also uh, interesting that, that the, the, the joke is off color. The joke is off color in 1972. He makes this saying that he says the thing, the, the, the joke is that, that rape is the one positive thing about this murder. The the barmaid thinks that's hilarious and goes, you know, is like, oh, you naughty boy. It's a it's a it's an offensive joke at the time, and and, and that's that's part of that's that's part of what's what's going on. I I find it fascinating. I mean, I now here uh, um, and Tony, I realize you you actually started to say something, so I don't want to. I, I I should loop back around, but I want to throw this out that that uh, Julia pointed out. She goes now. Would it be appropriate if you were taking this film and you were going to go show it tonight, would you, you know, just take a little snip, just like snip the joke out, just like make it disappear? Like, would that, you know, it would, what? Or should we, do we want to, like, because that's what the debate that we've been having a lot lately in in our society is, um, do we want to mute history um or you know cut out the his the parts of history that are ugly or should we be studying those and looking at, th- looking at them but yeah but again um i do know that uh that tony had wanted to say something although i don't know if if he's still with us or if he's, yeah, 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 yeah there he is <laughs> no um i i just saw it as this is again like i said before it's peak british and the way these guys act are rich you know they come in swaggering oh you know yeah. we gotta have a hot meal and this is, I think it's more of a comment on the way that society in general treats all of this. And when you're that far removed from it, to these guys, they're, it's not something that affects them other than it's in the news. And so they're like, yeah. oh, well, you know, I'm going to make this off-color joke. Oh, here's, that's amusing. Ha ha. You know, the waitress has probably seen them before. She knows them. She knows they may or may not tip well. Oh, you guys are so bad. That kind of right. thing. And it's oh, just God. Kind of, yeah. right. you know, that's you just well, the other thing is about this Tony. movie. Yeah. The other thing is about this movie is whether whether Hitchcock was intentionally trying to comment on that or not, it's certainly in it, is this movie says a lot about an institutionalized misogyny. And it's yeah. all oh, over absolutely. it's all over this movie, even you know, in tiny bits like the guy's relationship with his wife. And you know, Julia asks the question, you know, and I, I you know, I've debated this a lot with other people. I, about whether or not we, we should cover up the unsavory stuff or not, I actually think it's incredibly wrong. Like, I, I think 
that if you, you put a Band-Aid on a wound, you know, that's gushing, it's just going to gush through. The only only way we're ever going to be able to conquer the dark side of society is if we confront it head on. And certainly censoring old pieces of art is, mm. to me, dis- it's, it's dishonest. And, well, and yeah, because you know, some of it, it, sometimes we're seeing how far we've come when we look at that stuff. And sometimes we're seeing how far we haven't come because like the Me Too movement has really shown us how much of this is still going on. You know, when people talk about, gosh, he would make these jokes and I didn't think they were funny, but I couldn't say anything because he was my boss or he was my whatever you know my and so i think um to a, to a large extent you're right that we have kind of a responsibility to to look at these things and see okay are we have we have we actually come as far as we think we have or are we still making these same kinds of mistakes can i read well, a, a oh go ahead tony sorry well also you know if i if i were to read a description if i were to go to wikipedia hey there's this Alf- alfred hitchcock film i haven't seen and i read it and go oh man well, i don't really want to see the rape and murder scene that's terrible. I'm probably not going to watch that. If it hadn't been for this podcast, I would have also missed some of the best suspense moments that he's done in a film that I remember. The, you know, like like I was talking about the, the truck scene when we get to that. That's a masterclass and just yes. the, the way that he shoots it and, the, <laughs> and how that all works out and everything like that. And that tracking um, scene too, the, the tracking yeah. scene down the hall or up the at the stairs, yeah. All of that stuff, uh, you know, I again, I could do without that scene, but the rest of it is, you know, pretty fantastic for a thriller. So I think well, it the... depends on what you want to, you know, put in your head or watch or, you know, it's up to the, it should be up to the viewer, in in my opinion. Um, There's an other bit of dialogue in the, the scene in question that I also think is important to discussing, you know, Rusk as, as a character, as an antagonist is these two gentlemen mentioned that he's probably impotent, you know, like, which, which of course differentiates him from a, from a, you know, we were talking about 50 shades of gray that differentiates him from a fetishist or something yeah. like that. Like this, this guy is a, you know, like he's a, he's a psychopath yeah. and I, he is a very well drawn character, but he is very, very like by the time you get through this movie, you hate Russ. Yeah. Like, I cannot recall hating, like, I kind of hated him a little bit from, like, scene one, because he's a bit obnoxious. Totally but, obnoxious, yeah. But, yeah. By for the, for the he listener, this- he's just, a, just to, to recap, for the listener, Rusk is the guy who is secretly a serial killer, you learn very early on, but he is a wealthy, well-suited, um, smarmy-ass, blonde, uh, you know, sideburned, and sadist. blue suit wearing sadist, sadist who runs a vegetable market and is kind of the mac of the of the uh of the sort of well, the market street where he works. You also get that he's he either even the cops acknowledge like he he's either in some seedy stuff or knows all the people who are in the seedy stuff. Yes. Cuz the cops <laughs> come by and like, "Hey man, in also a very very British cop way." <laughs> yeah. "Hey man, if you, you know, you're the kind of guy who knows some things." So That's true. if you hear some things, you know who to call. <laughs> that would be us. That's totally they, true. They don't really say any like, but they really give the impression that it's not just vegetable. Also, he he, we know this also because he gives uh, Blaney like, "Hey man, I know the people who know the races. Here's a twenty to one bet." Like he's he's a the the vegetable market is probably a, a very small part of everything he does. Yeah, yeah. You know, if he weren't like felled by this addiction to, you know, the need to torture, rape, and murder, he actually would probably be doing pretty well. He's just, uh, it's just, that's an extreme. Well, he's doing party. pretty well up until the point he gets caught, actually. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's, he's still that's doing well. Well, the, totally the, the, you know, the, you know, like he does have like a very perverse way he handles himself with like the other, like Bob's your uncle, Bob's your uncle. Like he keeps, yeah. he keeps saying that. And he does seem like, you know, a possibly obnoxious relative that you might have. Like, yes. he, he, but uh, like I don't, can't recall another movie that I watched where I wanted to see the antagonist die horribly. <laughs> yeah. In, in such a long time. Like, well, and what's so super terrible. frustrating is that apparently the book, I haven't read the book, but the book that it's based on is called Goodbye Piccadilly, Farewell Leicester Square. Yeah, um, like apparently he doesn't actually get, um, he, he actually gets away with it and, and Dick goes to jail uh, for the for the murders. Like it, 
it has a very unsatisfying ending. So I'm glad at oh, least wow. that the film, the film doesn't, uh, doesn't do that's that. That's sort to of us. like the, uh, and this is a spoiler um, for Flowers in the Attic, but that's like the book and movie of Flowers in the Attic. Because in the book, the mom, they never do catch the mom. You know, she's in the wind and, and there's, they're never coming back. Whereas in the movie, there's this whole, uh, there's this whole climax where they manage to confront and, and I think throw her off a roof, if I recall properly. But uh, yeah. Um, well, I, that's how it goes. I do, <laughs> it is but, interesting that, that, uh, that Hitchcock, you know, the, the two serial killers, he's, I mean, admittedly, they're both based on books, but the two serial killers he's put on celluloid uh, are both mama's boys. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of, although Rusk is very different than Norman, Norman Bates is kind of a pitiable, yes. uh, pathetic character because he doesn't actually know he's committing these murders. He's, right. he's you know, you, you, you have a degree of sympathy to, to uh, Norman Bates that, you, that I have, like Rusk is just. Rusk is a sadist. Incarnate. He really gets off on hurting people. And he also, uh, he appears to really get off on the se- on what a great secret identity he has. I mean, how perfectly he's managed to hide um, his, you know, everything that he's doing. Although he is on the verge of getting caught because he is going to these marriage placement services asking for women, who, asking for masochistic women for him to hook up with and none of them when he wants to help. Which, by the way, struck me as really strange because it seems to me there's got to be a few masochistic women who would be available, but none of the agencies who's going to are are interested in maybe, it. Although Even maybe, he's were. Like, maybe he's like the guy in a, a Payback where, you know, he's he's used enough services where they're like, there's no way we're touching this guy again. Like, you, <laughs> yeah, you no longer need, need our services. Well, that's, that's the kind of conversation it. they're having. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he's obviously, well, they, then that, that particular one, they're like, we don't do that at all. But you get the impression, probably he's tried this and he's, and eventually no one wants to deal with him. It's, it's also you interesting. Think he was- Knowing he was going to set up his his friend because like it seems a little like Convenient. strange that he would pick out his his buddy's ex wife. No, Boy, that's a, that that's didn't a, seem I strange think it's a coincidence, to me. But because like, that, that, is... didn't seem, that didn't seem strange to me because he he had been a, coming around looking like like you said looking for a uh, women to be hooked up with and so but he set his sights on the actual owner of the company who happens to be um blaney's ex-wife but i don't think i think it is a coincidence it's only when he get starts to get accused like everybody looks at blaney be, as you know just because he's been around and he's been arguing with her that he's like oh well that's a good that works out well for me because otherwise he would have been doing that from the start and he's you know it's only after after this particular murder that he goes interesting and i still feel like even with um even with the second so the second person that's connected to blaney that he kills is blaney's current girlfriend who's the girl that the woman that he was working with at, at a bar and again that sort of falls in his lap too and into the murderer's lap because it's not like he seeks her out she's just around and she seems to be uh, out of a place to stay because i guess she stays over the bar maybe um and so he says you know hey do you need a place to stay and she's like oh that would be great just for tonight because tomorrow she's running off with her her you know her um fugitive boyfriend and yeah. so that's when he kills her. We don't even see that murder. It's only alluded to because he says the same thing to her that he had said to Blaney's ex-wife, which is, you know, you're my, you're just my type, or you're my type of woman. So now, he, before you that's, before you describe uh-huh. the, uh, I, I I I know you wanted to get into the after the or the sort of the bit of suspense that plays out there with that shot, that amazing shot. Before you describe it, I, I just wanted to to bring up this quote that um that you and I had been discussing earlier today. And this and this gets back to what we were talking about with um, what Drew called censorship. And you could call it that, or you could call it this thing where we reevaluate a work of art and say, I don't think people should watch that anymore because let's say it uses it uses uh, racial slur like you know for like yeah, the sen- common sensitivity slur. editing <laughs> well yeah we we'll say that one refers to the romani people with a, with an un, with with a, an insensitive epithet or this one you know whatever it'll have attitudes i don't like anyway this today was from molly ringwald who was writing in the new yorker and she goes how are we meant to feel about art that we both love and oppose 
Erasing history is a dangerous road when it comes to art. Change is essential, but so too is remembering the past and all of its transgression and barbarism so that we may properly gauge how far we have come and also how far we still need to go. She was making the point saying, you know, she was looking at some of John Hughes' movies and also his essays and saying some of this stuff have moments that are truly immoral and reprehensible by modern standards. So is it right that we would keep watching him or should we just go ahead and put up warning signs and say, hey, don't watch 16 Candles. Uh, it's hard to defend some of the stuff in it. And she's saying, no, do watch it. Just, I guess, you know, have a discussion, have a, have a conversation going on, at least with yourself uh, about it. Anyway, uh, I thought that was a really neat or start a podcast, mm -hmm. watch it, and then discuss it for an hour and a half of uh, <laughs> what we think about, <laughs> about 16 Candles. Yes. Um, okay, you, you may return. You were talking about the second major murder. which and, Well, I was just it, saying, so yes, yeah, so he so he goes to murder the, the serial killer whose um, name is, what did you say his name is? It's, uh, well, Rusk. The, the actual Rusk. Guy, Rusk, yes, yes, yes. So Rusk has invited the... the um, Blaney's girlfriend to stay the night because she's out of a place to stay. And so she's like, Oh, that would be great. He goes, I'm not even going to be there. I'm going out of town. So just, I'll just, I'll just get you set up there and then I'm going to go. So he takes her up to his apartment and the camera, you know, leaves the two of them as he is saying to her, you're my type of woman and closing the door behind him. And then the camera just comes back down the stairs and out the door and through the stairs, down across the street as as people start crossing in front of the camera a person crosses it with a bag of potatoes uh, a van goes by some other things go by and it keeps tracking back and pulling in until you're seeing the building and it's really a remarkable shot and i was wondering how on earth they did that given that they didn't have the steady cam technology yeah. yet and i i found that it's um it's a, a like a track it's two it's actually two shots even though it looks like it's only one one is like i think it's, they, they call it a ceiling maybe a ceiling track inside but anyway mm. that's the track that's, that's just on uh the uh, just on them as going down the stairs and mm -hmm. then when the guy walks by with the potatoes that's a cut but it's still the same practical sh the, still same set it's the practical set it's just that they needed to switch over to their dolly cam that's the only reason that they did the cut and so uh but i thought that was brilliant that yeah. and then like tony was tony's going to talk about the um the the potato truck scene as well and those are two of the things that just really tell you that you're dealing with some exceptional directing um and then i have one other thing that i'll talk about later that is also a favorite for this film um as well but yeah so that's my one of my things that I wanted to, to talk about. I, yeah, so good, Drew. I, I, in, you know, like we talk about like the choices that you choose to make with the violence in this movie. You know, I think when I, I, I hate to say it because I'm in no way defending the other scene because I felt remarkably disturbed by it. But, but I think part of the reason why this other shot has so much impact is because the first murder scene is so horrible. And yeah. then you, 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 do the second go around it's it's much more it's, it's a ch they choose choose to be chased you know they don't they don't yeah. go full full on torture porn with it yeah. and you know which which i was glad for because i i wouldn't have been able to make it through another scene like that but you know it is very very impactful especially because both of these women you said it earlier jason both of these women you really like them yeah and you know like like they're they're marvelously done characters and you know like it just makes you feel so so sick yeah. inside you know it... you know it's funny though we talked you know you talked a little bit about well some of it's of the time so there's the women that you like and even the secretary who you know, Rusk is a total jerk to, um, probably because she won't give him the time of day, is pretty, is really strong and competent. And even the woman, the detective's wife, who her whole shtick is that she's trying to make yeah. grand dishes <laughs> that are completely horrible. And I don't know if Hitchcock is trying to make comment on British food, even though there's a lot of British food. Well, that was the other 
that's right. the other scene that I'm talking about, or actually the other the other series of scenes is that, that the other thing I loved about it, it was that woman because she reminded me of the mom in Better Off Dead who's always making the crazy meals. She just makes these hilarious like French meals that are just really probably very um haute cuisine, but they're like horrible. And you know, yeah. at one point the guy that just <laughs> even says he's like well let's see what your intuition because she's always telling like he he's not he has no sense of, of confidentiality he tells every detail of what he's doing in the investigations and she'll say her intuition's telling her that that guy didn't do it that this other guy did it whatever and he goes well let's see what what does your intuition tell you about what i want to eat and she goes well that you want to eat steak and potatoes but i've made you this other thing yes <laughs> that's what's crack. kind of awesome hey i think she's the kind of the prototype for um Mrs. Bouquet in Keeping Up Appearances, which uh-huh. um, another really great Clive Swift, who's in it as Blaney's friend from the RAF, is in that. And he's a great character actor. I love seeing him. In I don't know Keeping Up Appearances, but I've heard of it. Well, I, I, it's I, I basically this browbeaten guy and his wife who grew up on the wrong side of town mm-hmm. and is embarrassed by her relatives. and that, But she tries to keep up the whole keeping up appearances her trying to seem very ritzy I have. Past the end. but this woman kind of has that she it seems like she's the prototype for that character in the sitcom but what i found interesting well again because it's hitchcock so all this comedy stuff gives a way for him to discuss all the gruesome details of the murder and it kind of balances that out which i think is great and then also her but her intuition is totally correct yes. like she's a better they make her than her husband yeah, yeah, they make true. her out as very ditzy. Oh, she's making these terrible meals. Who would ever eat that? But she's the one who's actually more or less solving the case. Yes. Even though right. he, in, in a very like manly way, oh, well, uh, you know, I'll think about that, blah, blah, blah. But she's actually, even though they, I, I love the, the layers in there of her seemingly, you know, being very ditzy and kind of fawning, but actually being very competent and very smart about the psychology of people. Um, I, that that I thought was great because it doesn't start that way. You're like, oh, look, it's, you know, he's so put upon. And then like she starts pulling out all this stuff. <laughs> you're like, wow, she's actually a better detective than her husband. Yes. In no, many absolutely. Ways. At least in ways of uh, human psychology. Such as her fantastic. theory, why would like uh, in the in the world of like this crime, this so-called crime of passion, the, the rape and murder of of a man's ex-wife she's like why would he go over there and rape and murder his ex-wife uh when you know when he's obviously going to be the the you know the, the suspect like what would be the purpose of that especially well, also, if, already, well, also, what? if you know she's if he's already a about killer, how long they've killer. been married yeah. she's thinking about how long <laughs> they've been married and how what does she say that she's like look at we've no been passion. married right yeah they but can't, they, what was her joke married. i can't remember but uh, but but yes but you know also Given that that this is a serial killing that's been going on for months, it makes no sense that he would suddenly start killing people that he is related to. Now, having said all that, people do crazy stuff, so it is actually possible. She's just saying it's unlikely. You know, the, I don't, don't fault the policeman for thinking that Blaney like like it does really look badly for him, but yeah. you know, like <laughs> the, the the comment that the, his wife makes is that you know you wouldn't. You know, people who murder their wives, they don't murder their – usually murder their ex-wives that they've been split up for, from for, for two yeah. years. You know, they, right. they murder they would murder when you're hot-blooded and you're fighting and, you know, the yeah. marriage is falling apart. And, you know, it, it is – you know, she says it in a comedic way like Julia was saying it, but, yeah. like, it is actually a very astute, you know, observation of, of human behavior. And, you know, like, I think the thing about – Blaney is is a protagonist is he is kind of an asshole and he so like it, he's such a misanthrope that like it is really easy to believe that people would think that he's a serial killer yes yeah, so we should discuss that Blaney our main character is we know uh, uh everybody talk everybody mentions that he was really great in uh the Ar- in the air force but he's out of the air force and now what he is is a drunken jerkwad he is a dick to everybody he meets i mean the i totally believed it remember when he goes to he goes to dinner with his ex-wife who is paying because he got no money and he will say things to her and then she'll say oh well, that sounds so sad and then he'll come like oh, now you feel sorry for me Ugh. you know everything about him just 
makes you go, I would never spend another minute with this guy, you know, and, and it's mainly because he's a drunk, you know, but, but uh, it's, I mean, and I can't even think through the entire film, does Hitchcock ever give us a reason to like this guy? Or is he basically a jerk from the beginning to end? There's no moment when he like says, I'm going to stop drinking so much. <laughs> Cause well, it makes I'm guessing, I mean, he's, kind of, he's relatively nice to his girlfriend. Yes. That's true. But Although he doesn't then, seem like they're kind of stuck upset together. That, yeah. Sorry, Tony. No, no, it's it's. I mean, they're kind of just two peas in a pod at, at that point. Like they've yeah. been through some stuff, and they're gonna kind of go through some more stuff together. Yeah. But obviously, he's been a jerk for a long time because when he goes to visit his friend, who ends up, you know, also doing the well, you know, he was in the RAF, so I mean, I gotta help my friend, right? Yeah. Because he's he was such a good pilot. His his friend's wife is like, no way. A, he's wanted. B, she seems to have known he's a jerk the whole time. Yeah. I don't know if he's ever made a pass at her. We don't know, but she's having none of that. And there's probably a good reason. <laughs> that and yeah, that the reason is he's suspected of being a serial killer. I mean, yeah. that's the reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, in general. She's, I don't think, even if that hadn't happened, I don't think she would have been like, oh, yeah, you just come on in. Yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you stopped. Yeah, she doesn't seem to be surprised that he's accused of being a serial killer. She seems to be yeah. like, well, of course he did it. That's the hilarious thing is all the people that know him in everyday life, when, when the police come around going, you know, we think he might be a serial killer, they're all like, ah, oh, yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, well, he nobody. doesn't seem too upset that his ex-wife and his girlfriend are br- brutally murdered like 24 hours apart from one another. That's like, a that's, super that's good the point. Thing Agreed. That, like, like, yeah, totally. That's. I think that's that's such an that's such a good point that it must. That's just a that's just a plot hole. I I, I really believe because I don't think anybody. You're totally right. He doesn't, and it's just for for the convenience of the plot. He doesn't absorb at all. My ex, the two most important women in my life have been killed. Um, yeah. Look, I don't, I don't even particularly like. I had a very contentious divorce, and I, I don't speak to my ex-wife very often. But like, if I were to find out she'd been murdered, I would be, I'd be pretty, I'd probably be in tears. Absolutely. Well, he's just—he's a classic narcissist because he's just like, oh, poor me. Um, I my these two women have been murdered. Now I'm being blamed for it. I, my life sucks. Yeah. Or, that's that's the thing that that's why you hate him from the beginning is because he always is like, poor me. And no matter what's going on, it's he's the victim. It doesn't matter what else. Well, is he happening. has a lot of pride too. He has stupid yeah. pride. Like he won't he won't take money from anybody. Like like the money that his ex wife gives to him has to be forced upon. He is a very interesting he's an anti-hero really yeah like because he's not he's not likable in any classical sense you know like you feel bad for him because you feel bad for him as another human being that you know like it's like it's you know his life does very quickly turn to shit and you know like and again he's he's of course much he's he's only marginally more likable than than rusk because he's not a psychopath (laughs) <laughs> well, he's also out of money his friend yeah. tells him to bet he's like hey i have this big this deal you should bet on this race he spends the last 10 you know 10 bucks or whatever how much it costs on a drink yeah. doesn't do the bet and then is mad that he didn't spend it on the bet instead yeah. because he's a drunk he's such, and, a, he's such a pathetic drunk yeah and i you know i've personally known people very similar in, in fashion and yeah. you just watch it and you're like, wow, just snapping defeat from the jaws of victory every time. And that's this guy's lot in life, no matter what, just because <laughs> whatever happened in life, that's just what he's going to do. And it's tough to watch. But again, it's like you said, nobody, when they, when they come around, they're like, oh man, he would never, he would never do that. No one says that. Right. Well, his, his army buddy, his air force buddy. Except, yeah, does, he's, army the, buddy. he's the only one. So yes. he must have been hot shit in the air force. <laughs> yes. Well, that's more of a fraternity. That's a that's. Boys club I think his air thing. force buddy is even almost to the point where it's like you know who knows. But anyway, I'm not going to yeah. betray my friend. <laughs> but but again. <laughs> what I find awesome is that when it comes to like helping your friend or going to Paris, yeah. he's still like, dude, I really, I don't mean to go to Paris all the time. Um, <laughs> so, kind of need well, to they leave. were going to smuggle him out into Paris. And like, again, like, I, my, my, 
even though I know within the movie, you know, he's he's not the serial killer. My sympathies are still with his his military buddy's wife because she's like, oh no, you're not taking Jack the Ripper to, to, yeah. to Paris. <laughs> the next, the next my killer gets to stay here. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's not actually at all what happened. What happened was she go. He goes. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna be able to help you out and give you an alibi for that second murder of your girlfriend yeah. because we got Paris. Then the wife leaves and he goes. Oh wait a second. You know what? Oh no, no, no. You're right. You're right. It was the other way around. That he was gonna. Um, he was gonna give the the guy a job in Paris, but he doesn't says he says that when the wife is not there. So then yeah. I was thinking, oh my god, the wife's gonna be so pissed off when she finds out that now he's invited because she's like, we have to go yeah. to Paris. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I've, been, I've, been, I've invited this this fugitive and his girlfriend to Paris. But then I think is when they're like, well, we can't do the alibi thing because then we won't be able to go to Paris. So you're, yeah, you're on your own. So yeah, you're right at that the, point. But and also, it, this is <laughs> also because she's like, again, the voice of reason. If you say that you have an alibi, you're also now you've harbored a fugitive. Yes. What does yeah. that leave us? And again, that puts us in jeopardy of not going to Paris. <laughs> Well, this right, is exactly. part of the complicated near misogyny, though, of this movie. There is a there is a certain level of that women that that women beat up on men, and yet the men clearly deserve to be beaten up on. This this that guy, you know, Blaney's friend, would be making you get the impression probably a lot of bad decisions if his wife weren't around to roll her eyes and sort of knock him back you know down on onto the proper track like because he's probably so strangely enough he plays a fairly similar character in keeping up appearances where his wife definitely runs yeah rough shot over him and he and and detective oxford like like you said detective oxford uh his wife knows better how to solve this this murder than he does even though he has the power he has the institutional power but she has the brain to point out like what's going on and she knows her place well enough that he has to be coaxed into coming up with it himself and then finally there's the example of the couple at the beginning of the film where you have this this (laughs) horrid horrid new wife who's like informing her husband that when they get married he's going to be getting up at 4 45 or something oh, to yeah. like clean the house and whatever and be sure not to wake well, her no, up it's the it's there they're a new match from the from yes. the uh the matchmaking co- company and yeah. she just says she doesn't say you're going to be doing the stuff she's like you know my late husband was amazing he would always clean the house and he'd do it before i even woke up and he didn't wake me up and it was and then he'd get me my tea and then the guy's just kind of like, oh, crap, what have I gotten myself into? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but don't you no, think really... that, that Hitchcock himself had a pretty complicated relationship with women and femininity? Oh, and, absolutely. Like, you know, like, I, 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 I think, you know, that's all been pretty well documented. But, he, he, you know, he was very doting on his wife in some ways. But, it, like, you know, he also always had these very complex relationships that were very weird with like the actresses in his in his film yes his wife so. actually had a stroke during the making of this film by the way oh. so he yeah was, he was not on on he wasn't able to be on um on the lot whenever for a while he had uh it's a really nice relationship the, the, it, well it's an interesting relationship with his wife there was uh, there's been a lot of writing about that you know it was a long-standing relationship um you know but did he fetishize and have weird fascinations with his with his female leads and then terrorize them sometimes in cruel ways all these things are things that i've heard about uh, about alfred Hitchcock. He, he had some some hashtag me too's as well okay. i i i actually don't know it's a really good question you know whether I mean, there's a documentary um again i'm sure it's contentious of what all is fact and fiction in that even but yeah i mean the, yes they go through that it's you know all of that is is played out throughout the movie um yeah. i guess we hadn't covered that for some reason i thought we had covered that at some are point are you talking about the toby jones movie with uh where he plays where, where toby jones plays hitchcock uh, i think that's it yeah yeah no we didn't cover it on the show but now that you bring it up <laughs> it would be really great actually yeah uh, um i think helen mirren played the wife in fact in that yeah well and, there was and, also an anthony hopkins 
movie where he was Hitchcock too. They like came out within like a year or so of each other. Oh, then I'm confused. I, yeah, yeah I'm, Pel- not, Pel- I'm also I'm probably blending the two. Like I watched both of them. Yeah, and I can't. I'm you know it's been a while since I've seen them, so I'm probably blending bits of each. Helen Mirren was actually one. offered the the role of Babs in this film, and she turned it down. She regretted it later. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, but I do remember her being wonderful as as Hitchcock's spouse, and and I had heard before that she often also came up with, you know, she worked with him in a sense as a writer, as a creative consultant. Um, but yeah, he had an embarrassing amount of obsession with uh, various of these uh, uh, leads. But uh, where does that get us? What, uh, I, 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 I fear we've got. We should talk track. about the potato truck. We should talk about yes, the potato truck because that's yeah. the, the last major piece of this among the like two or three set pieces. There's definitely the murder. That tracking shot is the second, and then the potato truck. So, uh, uh, Julia, well, Drew, we haven't heard from you a lot, so if you want to describe um, the potato truck, uh, then uh, go crazy. Well, the killer, Rusk, as we were talking about earlier, he murders the hero's girlfriend, and because he works in this district that has a lot of like street market he disposes of the bodies of the women he kills by putting them in these potato trucks and one of his his things that he does compulsively after he murders women is he has this pen with his initial on it that he oh. he takes it out of his tie and puts it on his coat now what he comes to realize after he's dumped this body <laughs> into onto this potato truck is that the the girlfriend, while they were struggling, while she was fighting for his life, she <clears throat> had picked the the pin off of him and has it now in her hand. In her hand is in a, a death grip. So mm-hmm. he has to go back and try and obtain this pin. But of course, in pure Hitchcock fashion, the truck starts moving with him in it while he's <laughs> trying to Force the dead, stiff fingers of this even, it's almost but, even in death that this woman is spiting him because he, he, he has to pry the pen free with a nail file and it's and he's being thrashed about by the truck and the potatoes and this corpse that actually kicks him in the face a couple of times just by being thrashed about of the motion of this truck. It's, it's, it's a remarkable scene because you, again, at this point you hate this guy, but you're still kind of completely enthralled with him trying to get this pin out. Well, it's, it's, yeah. it's Hitchcock's mastery of this. Because it, it doesn't, again, the way it plays out. So he's calm and cool. He dumps the body. Yeah, I've done it again. Woohoo! And then it's not until he gets back home. <laughs> and, you know, other less masterful people might do it with like jump shots or whatever, and he slowly plays it back. Like, wait, where's my pin? No, and then he remembers. No, so he's got to run down there because he's he doesn't want to be seen because there's enough traffic that he he thought he got away. Yeah. He gets on the truck, <laughs> and it's not just the thrashing about. He accidentally dumps. He's got to figure out a way not to get seen by the cars that are behind the truck. So he's pulling off potatoes. Potatoes are going into the road. The guy stops. He almost gets caught. And this is how, like, like Hitchcock is the master of, like, layering these things. Yeah. So, okay, he doesn't get caught. And we're all kind of rooting, almost, like, maybe this will be it, right? We know this can't happen because <laughs> there's more runtime in the movie. But, you know, he's getting dirty. He's a very fastidious person. He's He has to pull the body out as well, as well as keep all the potato sacks from being revealed, <laughs> from revealing him. And as he's peeling, pulling the body out is where it's like kicking him, things are shaking. Um, and then he realizes he's got to, like he, the nail file breaks, he's got to break her fingers to get this pin, all because yeah. he keeps his pin on, even though he knows he's going to murder people with a tie. But his yeah. his vanity will not let him not have his R for Rusk diamond yeah. pin on his, what, he wouldn't have like to a do that. No, no, it's not that. It's that he knows it'll give him away. I mean, well, he knows true, gonna I mean, he me. keeps that on. He he murders people with a tie, yeah. and yet yes. he always has his tie pin right, right, because right. he's vain. Yeah. So, and you know what? Well, I gotta also, say, like I said, it seems very ritualistic too. Yeah. Like, yeah. It seems like a compulsive thing. But I mean, so you, really you wouldn't have to do any of this if he just wasn't that vain. Yeah. But that's his yeah, signature it's really thing. Frustrating. 
agree that the forensics in this film aren't like I'm used to forensics being now. And I don't know how much of that is just shortcuts and how much of it is that they just didn't have it. Obviously, they have fingerprints because they say, um, they say, you know, hey, we should fingerprint the place. And there's like all the losers that come through the place, meaning the agency, the matchmaking agency, all the guys that come through this place, we would, we, there would just be hundreds of fingerprints. But it really bothered me that they never found the nail file, which would have his fingerprints all over it that one put, pissed me off i was like come on that would have been a really easy thing to have but i mean there's so many things like i mean this guy doesn't seem to use any kind of a condom or anything when he rapes people so there would be like all kinds of dna evidence but i don't know to what extent they could use like blood typing or 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 anything even though they didn't have actual dna or if they just didn't do i don't know but i just frust frustrated me that the forensics were so in in, in, in what's the word i have what no idea were, what were they able to do in the 70s because that's like a whole yeah, I don't I mean, I think you could, blood, you could blood type. You could blood type semen, but uh, I, yeah. I found it frustrating that when he he manipulates Blarney into getting caught, and the, as they're taking this guy away, he's screaming, "It's Russ!" It's yeah. rough, and he does it again in the in the um, in the in his court. Yeah. And this is the only time we finally start to see sort of this 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 cracks in this guy's emotionality, where we 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 start to see him get a little bit hysterical. And I I just I don't understand why the police wouldn't at least question this guy yeah. you know like oh well the body was found in a you know on a, the back of a potato truck well this guy deals in groceries like mm. it's totally well, and, and the fact that he that. was yeah the fact that their their main suspect was arrested at rusk's house yes so if he's saying well i didn't have her clothes in my bag before but once i left rusk's house suddenly i do seems like it's worth at least looking into like you're saying no well, it's I just that there's back to yeah. To why would we? I mean, Rusk is an above the board kind of guy. It's not to really investigate his actual proclivities. Yeah. But, I mean, this what? is definitely a classism kind of thing, which happens. Oh, yeah. not just classism, but lazy investigating, because I think well, that well. actually happens quite a bit is that you have people going, this is an easy case if we just do an open shut case. Like you'll, you'll see oftentimes in the sure. in TV shows and whatever, you'll see people go, uh, oh, come on. Why are you... Just leave well enough alone. We've got our guy. Let's not get into yeah. this goose, wild goose chase. Well, what, although, I, I can't believe that Rusk would stop killing people. Like, like I, he might lie low. It's a solid low, point. Low, like, 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 <laughs> like, he would eventually have to murder somebody again. And they go, oh, well, we thought we had yeah, the next time to wear in jail. Well, in fact, they do. Didn't. They do exactly copycat. that. Because our guy... Our guy goes on the run and it just so happens that rusk has committed another murder just that You're night. right he killed yeah he killed somebody while the guy was in jail so he yeah he couldn't even that's win. true yeah i hadn't and, thought about that but it's a totally good point yeah you know i i even though the way this movie ends with like <laughs> the, the witty the witty the witticism of oh your necktie is missing is very hitchcockian my yeah. level of hate for this character and I have to <laughs> walk this back a little bit for a second because the actor playing Rust is excellent. He does an excellent job. And I think the fact that I do hate this guy so much is actually a testament to how good he is in this movie playing this character. Um, but, you know, him just getting arrested to me was almost like, no, I, you know, I, this is where I almost wish this had a little bit, you know, more yeah. modern sensibility so I, I could see this guy yeah. getting horror like i wanted to see blarney <laughs> cave his head in with that tire iron like yeah. i i i didn't want the you know after everything i didn't want the 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 you know the british humor ending i wanted to see that guy's teeth smashed out of his face. there could have been there could have been a chase on the roof like i say this is what they did with the end of flowers in the attic is that instead of mom never shows up again it's mom shows up and somehow we wind up chasing her across a rooftop so that she can fall to her death i mean yes uh yeah they could have done that they gave us something that could be filmed on a stage oddly enough um yes it, it's uh it is it is a sort of a comic ending and it's a way for our guy you know blaney to to kind of to emerge as a as a hero they they well, the they way get... he breaks out of jail is very cool yeah, well, remind me again how he breaks out. This is all, that's he escaped my mind. He throws himself down a flight of stairs in a, a oh, yes. suicide attempt. Yeah. He has to be put in the hospital. 
And then when he's right. in the hospital, he drugs the guard with sleeping yeah. pills. He okay. And then he, well, all he of the dresses guys, all up of the like guys a doctor. Were... All of the guys who are in the wing with him contribute their sleeping pills. They all help. Yeah, because yeah. They, they all think it's hilarious that he's going to break out. By the way, this guy who's playing the main character, I had no memory at all of who he was. But um, he was the star of Roman Polanski's Macbeth. And that's uh, that's an amazing performance. And that was 1971. So So that was just a year before this. Uh, he, you know, he had a long career after all of this, but I was not really particularly aware of this actor, but that I remember very well, you know, that, that he was, a, he was a fantastic movie about. So we had a good, good couple of years of, uh, of interesting stuff. You know. So that brings us to the end of Frenzy. It's such an interesting choice, this one. I don't know if I, if, if I ever would have had, had a chance to watch it. Let's get our final thoughts. I think it went, uh... Did we go Julia, Drew, and Tony? Was that the order that we went in? I'm, I'm trying to find it. Uh, yeah, so, it was, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll do that anyway. And if it, if it's wrong, I apologize. <laughs> so, Julia, lay it on us. Um, we've talked about frenzy. Uh, what are your What are your final thoughts here? And also, you know, we, we're bringing these films to one another. Do you think that the audience should like go out and order this up? It's on Amazon Prime. Well, yes, with the caution, again, that if you are um, not going to uh, be able to watch something where p- women are being brutally murdered and raped uh, without it just, you know, really screwing with your head, then don't do it. But um, it's, as far as Alfred Hitchcock films go, this is a great one. There's some really great directorial choices, some fun. I'm not sure, you know, how much of it, how much of the comedy stuff is him versus the screenplay writer whoever but there's some comedic stuff that's great um you know and then yeah we've talked about the things that are frustrating and the things that are questionable as to whether we would have done it this way or we sh- we would recommend that they do it this way if they did it now um but yeah i think i'm really glad that we watched it um I don't usually watch things that do involve sex crimes like i said i don't watch that show um SVU because of that or anything else that that features that because I do find it to be um t- like that the, it's gratuitous like I feel like it's there because people are titillated by it no I may be wrong about that but that's kind of how I feel but I didn't feel that way about this particularly um so yeah thanks for indulging me wow wonderful uh Drew so final thoughts frenzy I liked this movie I I, I guess I it was the second time I've seen it I I always enjoy it when we get to talk about Alfred Hitchcock. Um, to answer your larger question, yeah, I do think that this is a movie that is worth watching, but I, I think the thing that I have to echo is that it's a disturbing movie and you have to, like, I, I wish that I had remembered more about it. You know, I watched it with my wife before before we both went to bed and we were both amply horrified. You know, the, the question that was often, you know, whether or not a movie is a horror movie or not and i definitely think this is a horror movie but not in the same way that you know a lot of the other movies we are in fact i think this movie is more horrific because it, it's something that happens unfortunately in real life but you know that being said even though i was disturbed by it it is an excellent movie and if you can get past the disturbing parts of it i think that there is a lot of storytelling especially for those of us who are creative you know i think there's a lot of storytelling and narrative stuff that you could pick up from this movie and you know witty dialogue which you know i feel like is not something we we have enough of in modern film so i i still would say it's worth it if you can you can handle the one horrible scene there there the rest of the movie is not gratuitous you know there's a there's one scene of gratuitous violence and the rest of the movie is, is honestly pretty tame. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I agree uh, completely. I love the, the balance of humor and suspense once you get past that, because it didn't, it felt a lot more brutal up until a point, um, a lot more raw than I was like, wow, this is Hitchcock, huh? This, and then it kind of does even out into kind of what we think of as Hitchcock. Mm-hmm. 
And yeah, you know, all the bits really start to shine again in how he layers things, how he'll have a scene of humor that breaks the kind of thriller aspects of it. Uh, yeah, I, I really, it's probably not a movie I would have immediately thought of to see, um, but I am really glad that we, we viewed it. It was really good. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's so many ways to look at a at a really disturbing scene like that because there are some people who say you know there there's the deliverance defense where they would be like actually I want to show things as as graphically as possible because I want people to be aware of how disturbing a crime like this is. Then there are those who go no, but remember by putting something on a giant screen, you glorify it whether you're. Uh, in the context inside the story, whether it's good inside the story, there's a context of seeing something on a giant screen that communicates into our brain that something is cool. That's complicated. Then there's the triggered people who are troubled by something, regardless of the context. There's all of that going on. Nevertheless, uh, whether whether it should be shown or shouldn't be shown, it is certainly masterful. I will say this was going on a lot at this time because the uh, Clockwork Orange comes out about six months after this movie does. Uh, it's useless to compare, but that movie has an extraordinarily disturbing home invasion, beating, yeah. rape, all that stuff going on. That is That is some hard stuff to watch. Straw Dogs came out a little less than a year before this movie, it also has an extraordinarily graphic attack. So uh, I don't know what was going on in cinema at the time. I don't know if it's just the new cinema was happening and people were trying to sort of break out of out of the Hays Code. But uh, you know, this was an exploration that was that was happening a lot. And I'm not even talking about Grindhouse. I'm talking about about a films like this is Hitchcock and that was that was you know Clockwork Orange which is a major picture Straw Dogs was Sam Peckinpah uh, so so this is what the straight houses were doing we're not even talking about grimy grungy grindhouse that was doing God knows what uh, anyway I, I was I was amazed by this film I'm I'm glad that we watched it and you're right if you can get through that one scene. Uh, this is basically a straight up sort of good humored ongoing man unjustly accused thriller. And, and that's all it well, is. Well, that's not really fair to say, because it is the one scene is the most disturbing, but every one of the women victims oh, yeah. is shown that's, that's pretty na- yes. na- naked, yeah. naked with their tongue sticking out or whatever else. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and choked to death. So, um, yeah, I think it gets disturbing several times, but that is the hardest part to that's watch. That's, that's, it's true. It's a totally good point. But the level that, that the rest of the victims are mistreated is about at the level that you might find on a typical episode of uh, CSI. You know, there's there's no... Uh, it's uh, I, which is which isn't saying anything particularly good about our culture. I'm just saying that that that's sort of where we are now. Is is that if you cut that one scene, you could probably show this on TV no problem. And, well, you, you know, could you, you couldn't have the nudity, but yeah, I hear it's here saying. Yeah, it's, no, it's a good question. Of course, now they can do things with cropping and 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 so forth mm-hmm. that make stuff disappear. Uh, Gosh, I I can't wait to like hear on the Facebook page if we if we've misread this. I, r- I really want people to sort of weigh in, you know, with with the question of I actually don't prefer to encourage people to watch films like this because X. I think there's even an argument somebody could make. I'm not going to make it, but it could be made that Hitchcock was such a big jerk that maybe we should find somebody else to replace him in the canon. You could make that argument. That's the Harvey Weinstein argument. Is uh, Harvey Weinstein's a big jerk, and we should stop watching his movies because there's lots of other good movies we should replace him with. Is that the case with Hitchcock? I don't. I don't know. I have no idea. I, mean, I, um, I think that that's again. I kind of my take is that's up to the viewer. Yeah. Um, I think that certainly there are people, there are musicians that I don't give money to. There are filmmakers who i don't go to see their movies yeah um, i think yeah i think you, everybody should weigh that um and i think also it, it is what you want to put in your brain like by no well, means if somebody was like hey i'm not going to watch this film i don't care if it's hitchcock how dare you yeah. I, I mean i still think that that's that's valid for that person yeah um there's yeah, no I mean, reason well, that, you, know, you, your life honestly... is short. you should do what you feel you should do 
you know? Yeah. You could skip this movie if you still wanted to, you know, if you wanted to study Hitchcock, you could skip this movie and still have literally dozens of movies to watch because he absolutely. made a fuck ton of them. So, yeah, like, if I, if, right. I, if, 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 like, if somebody were to say, no, this movie's too disturbing for me, I would respect that. That's I. That's oh, the oh, thing. Yeah. Like, I would totally get somebody saying, no, not for me, and, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pressure them i would say or you know i would say well then fast forward to the the potato truck scene or something you know because that that's the thing you need to see here you know but i wouldn't i mean I even that's uh, disturbing like I don't, I don't know if you i mean i guess the, the what it boils down to though right is is we have a horror movie podcast if you're okay with horror movies you're probably more okay with the yeah. level that's of like, the potato truck scene um Again, like I've said, I mean, I tend on paper, I don't know if I would watch this because I tend to watch less, uh, for lack of a better term, realistic horror, you know, just because of the way the world is lately. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, I definitely am uh, to each his own within reason. Yeah. No, I can, I so, can see that. Go ahead. Can, okay. Yeah. Um, so I was saying was, I, I think this actually leads into my endorsement. So I'm going to, um, kind of do both at once here i i think that punishing people who are in a film or who worked on a film because the person who was directing them or producing them is a jerk isn't really fair but if yes i i I agree that if the person's a jerk and they're making all the money on the film every time you watch it then maybe don't watch it but i don't know that 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 i find that one tough because you know if someone victimizes everybody that's that worked for them and then you don't go and see the product that these artists made for that reason now you're kind of double victimizing them i think anyway so that's just a possible way to look at that but uh so what i wanted to talk about wow i hadn't thought about that what what i want to talk about with my endorsement though is um i really loved ready player one and it's interesting because i've been hearing a lot of talk about how we shouldn't be enjoying a film that's that once again makes a white male the center of the universe and the hero but the problem is that this particular white male that wrote this this book and this film is somebody we actually know and so and and so i i know for a fact that that the character in the film is just a fantasy version of the person who wrote it and it's just how he sees it's his like jason says it's the map of his brain it's the things he's obsessed with and it's he's put himself into the movie as the hero as most of us would love to do if we had the opportunity so I find it really hard to say, let's not watch this film because it was written by a white male. Because I almost think that's the same as saying, let's not watch the film because it's written by a black person or a woman. Like, I, I don't, I, I'm struggling with it. I get that we want to have more art out there that makes, you know, women and minorities the hero and, and are centered around those people. I loved, you know, well, I'm not going to even go into the, the examples, but... But I don't think it means you shouldn't see something that is enjoyable just because it's made by a white male and it features him. I don't know. That one I've really struggled so, with. And so I, I'm finding a very interesting conversation in uh, in uh, on social media yeah. about that. And I think part of it is a little personal for me because I've, we've actually used to hang out with Ernie back in Austin. So I'm kind of uh, also trying to question my own objectivity <laughs> on this well, particular issue. Yeah. So, Julia, one of the things that I've discovered, because I had a friend who was basically just dogging the book left and right. Yeah. And some other people chimed in and were basically taking Ernie to task because he was a white guy. Guy, white heterosexual male. Yeah. Like, identifies as male, definitely, you know, everything, nerdy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, geek, geek power fantasy, basically. But the problem is, and there's a, there's a couple of really good articles, and a lot of the backlash is because Gamergate happened. And there's a yeah. couple of really good articles on why that is probably part of the backlash. Now, when the book came out, again, I've known Ernie for a long time. And for me, like, there's there's some things about the book that I'm like, I have my own things with, but I thought the book was, it's just Ernie. <laughs> like, yeah. if you've known him for any length of time, you're like, I mean, it's about as, oh, I forgot, what the, whatever the male version of Mary Sue is, as you can get. Party Stu. Yeah. It's just, it's just Ernie, all of Ernie as a dude, liking all the things and yeah. for better or worse, right? Like inherently you're either kind of on board with that or not. And if you are, I don't have a big problem with it. If you aren't, that's fine too. I mean, you don't have to like it. The, 
The big problem is, A, in that interim time, a lot of really bad Gamergate, nerd, white power, fan like male power fantasy stuff came through, which was really bad. Mm-hmm. You know, and in the book, um, there's also a, a line, I can't remember the, the line exactly, where it does, um, it's pretty insensitive to, you know, uh, trans, uh, transgender people. And that's unfortunate. Um, and again, like if, like, I can't defend that, right? It's just, it's a line that's in there that I'm like, oh, that's not how I would have put that. That is. That's that... kind of funny to me because the movie has, to me, one of the first gender fluid yeah. hero characters. Yeah, so, so does, I mean, the movie does from the book. I've seen it in a, like, the, in, a main, in, a, in a very mainstream movie. Yeah, I didn't yeah. talking about the book, but that, that's kind of strange that you would you'd make a leap of, from a place to insensitive to one that I would say well yeah like, I had no it, idea again, that there was any kind of controversy over it like I, I enjoyed the movie I think it's a lot of fun I, 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 I have no memory of there being anything insensitive in the book uh, other than I, just I mean the, well, the character of H is definitely there the character definitely turns out to be uh, a woman uh, masquerading as, as a man in the Oasis there's uh, some, there is some stuff in there because several of my friends brought it up because yeah. again that like i am going to be slightly biased because i know ernie yeah and he's been a friend for a while um well, I, don't, I, don't I don't think of him i don't i also don't think of him like i've known Ernie long enough that i actually wrote this friend of mine i was like hey he's not a gamergate kind of bro dude he's not but he's actually he's really he's like a really, age. ernie's he's a really generation geek, x he's, <laughs> he's always been really cool he's never said or done anything that I felt like, man, I don't really want to hang out with that guy. Yeah. And, you know, I've well, known some people where I definitely like, I know them, but i have not, get, you know, they've done enough yeah. stuff where I'm just like, oh man, that's, well, that's not I, a cool person to hang I out wanna with. I want to add, Tony, I want to add that my daughter, who is 16 and incredibly progressive, I mean, she will question everything I say as being like insensitive or not. You know, yeah. if I ever go, well, right. well, he or she or whatever and she's like mom i've told you it's they and why why are you having such a hard time with this and like she just but she went and saw the film and did not find anything well again the and film is wasn't... different from the book like the, the no, things that the book people too. have problems with are not in the film for the most well yeah. some some of them are some of them aren't but in general i'm talking mostly on the book most uh, of the most how. of the problems that that people have had with it truly I, I i agree with what you said tony it's been more about context is that when that book came out in 2011 there was the 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 going thesis was you know what the nerds are finally ruling the earth it's great it's wonderful and then gamergate happened and there was this notion of hey wait a minute as this woman on slate said and i think she said it very profoundly she goes i'm angry and pissed off that I feel excluded from the enjoyment of all of this pop culture. So yes, I do bring a lot of anger to my review of this movie, even though the movie has nothing to do with the things I'm angry about. The context is what makes me angry. And, and I, I understand that. I had no anyway, idea that, that there are up team bazillion think pieces on, on <laughs> Reddit. Yes, I feel true. profoundly <laughs> ignorant about this. I, 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 I've seen, you know, a lot of my queer and and friends that are of color seem like they like the movie. Uh, yeah. um, well, maybe this is an ecosphere, and it's not a not. And maybe the maybe I, 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 I had no idea. Like this, it was actually going to be my my endorsement of the the week is as well. I just found it to be a fun delight. It's not a great movie, it's it, you know, but it's got a lot of charm, and I can't wait to have a, a, a Blu-ray of it so I can I can slow down all of the um sure Absolutely. the the crowd scenes so I can pick out all of the different characters in a more. But I mean, come on! It's a movie where the Iron Giant fights Mechagodzilla. If you can, if you hate that, you're kind of soulless. Do, do you know, <laughs> but... do you know what, what I loved the most about that book? And I'm the most sad that it didn't make it into the movie, it, it, because it, everything got replaced with other stuff. The you, you know how an air guitar, the way you win an air guitar is being able to play note for note exactly right, like the model, basically, and that's the way that game is played. Ernie imagined in Ready Player One a kind of game where you would gain points by walking in VR through like an episode of Family Ties or the movie War Games or whatever, and you would get better and better points the more perfectly you matched 
the actions by the second of the character that you were inhabiting. So if he's playing Matthew Broderick in war games, and this actually happens, then the more his body movements match Matthew Broderick's movements, and he like waits at the last minute to turn around and grab a backpack instead of doing it too early or too late, he would win points. That's brilliant. So that was hilarious. It's a commentary on all kinds of things, but it's also just, just smart and cool. And uh, none of that was in the movie because I, it probably wasn't I, interesting. I had to, <laughs> but I mean, come on. That's the, the scene where they recreate the Overlook Hotel is worth oh, yeah. the price of admission. Right, like, but it like, doesn't play the way it would in the book. In the book, if you were to and do I, I haven't read that book either, so I'm coming from a place of ignorance there. I, I went in just as some just as somebody who wanted to watch a big, loud, dumb spectacle. Right, right, right. Movie they replace war games. Yeah, they they yeah. do replace war games with The Shining, but if they were doing it the way they'd done in the book, like I love the movie by the way, don't, don't get me wrong. But if they had done it the way they do it in the book, you would be like the kid, or you would be Shelley Duvall or Jack Nicholson, and you'd gain points. But it'd be boring to watch. That's that's right. the thing. I mean, like you, you couldn't you couldn't actually. That's why it gets translated into a different thing, where basically they go to an amusement park ride of The Shining. Fine, okay. The, the... You know. Funny thing, the thing that I think that I found myself as a as a person who who is immersed in geek culture and goes to a lot of cons and everything, the thing that I found the most preposterous because yeah. I actually find it to be a very likely future that this this is where we could end up in a few years. Actually, like everything about it, I was like, no, I could, I could, I had the same reaction to this as I did to Wally. Mm. Um, you know, is that you know this seems like something that could actually where we could end up. But you know, being around a lot of cosplayers and everything, and you know, the the, the Oasis is like one one you know it's it's half multiplayer you know RPG, half social media, and half giant cosplay party. And I'm telling you, the people in the Oasis was far were far too disciplined because we would see. We saw one Harley Quinn, and we saw one Deadpool. <laughs> where in reality, there would point. be millions of of Harley Quinns running around everywhere. Well, that's a you good know, point. Yeah, uh, that was like awesome. the thing that I found found most unrealistic about <laughs> the the movie, which is kind of a strange thing to say. But I I um you know I'm guessing I'm gonna just go into my endorsement right now because yeah, I'm endorsing the same thing that Julia did. I found this to be a really fun movie with a lot of 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 heart in it and you know i didn't think it's perfect it's not gonna be my favorite new spielberg movie but you know the the race sequence is great the scene that's in you know um the shine where they go inside the shining is great so if you're a horror fan you have that there's also like to me like the choices that they made like there's a cameo i've been talking about this on my my facebook there's a cameo of chucky at one point in the movie and it also happens to be the only f-bomb the only fuck in the entire yeah. movie and of course it's when chucky appears and yeah. so there's like there's like a level of of like fandom even in the the script and like the, the fun that they have with the score like how they like pirate bits of the back to the future score they have like the old godzilla march from like the 50s and 60s godzilla movies when mecha godzilla shows up like there's a lot like yeah i guess you know we're now at a point where whatever movie is coming out like there has to be a bazillion think pieces Yes. About how it's supposed to represent everything that is right or wrong about culture <laughs> at this time, which I I get and I'm all for like smart analysis of pop culture, but at the same time, like let's take a step back and like it's like in response to what Julia said because I was ignorant of all of this. There is a H is a very like you know even when they show what she actually looks like. You know, I have a lot of queer friends. Like she comes, that is one of the most obviously without, without like walking it back too much because it's a mainstream movie. That's one of the most obviously queer characters in a mainstream movie that I've ever seen to the point where I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And like the, the, you know, the other two, you know, she's also African-American. Like, like, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess the hero is, a white guy so i i can i can kind of see why that seems a little stale in a in a post black panther world but like one of the other like like 
he, he the, the hero isn't like a, he like a, he succeeds because he has help from like two you know two Asian guys and a, a very strong woman right. and a very strong African American like it's a group effort like to me yeah. like right like it, uh, it, I feel Wade, like Wade, Drew I feel I feel like no, that white guys can't win in this universe now because if you were to write a story like let's say I knew a, an author who was a white male who wrote books for middle graders um if you were to write (laughs) if you were to write a book where the main character was a black lesbian i mean everybody would be like what are you doing right you don't know that voice like that's just stick to what you know so then you write a white male and they're like okay where are the people of color okay so you write a white male who's surrounded by people of color and you're like oh now they're just gratuitous people of color like what are you supposed to do not create anything else again because you're a white male that doesn't seem fair Anyway, I'm gonna I'm story. gonna walk back from saying that white males don't always win because yeah I'm gonna in the real world in the real world they do no, I'm just like saying, they, yeah. they, in this world and, and I, you cannot be PC be a white man. <laughs> and I mean I'm a I'm a I'm a writer and I'm I I'm white appearing you know I'm not as I've talked about on the show I'm actually mixed race but like I I I I'm not gonna say that I haven't like gobs of white privilege thrust upon me. But um, I don't think that this like like Wade never came across to me as like the the white savior trope. Like he came like this came to me, off to me more like ragtag band. Like if we're gonna get in the TV trope land, this seemed more like ragtag band of misfit. Yes, to me. he is um, a white but, savior by virtue of just being a white savior. He just is. It, it, the context is. But you could change it, and you yeah. could have changed his race, and he would have essentially been the same character. I will say that's, that, like if they had made him, absolutely. if they had made him like black or Latino or whatever, like the movie would have plugged along. And maybe that's what they should have done. I don't know. Um, you know that's. Like, all of this stuff, I feel like, you know, in my response to what Julia just said, in my response to everything, I think because of virtue of who is in the Oval Office, we are in an elevated state of national conversation, and we're not going to have a, a real well, that's cultural a solid consensus. Point. Yeah, I don't think we're going to have a cultural consensus about, you know, where we're at as a society that, that, that is I more, agree, more normalized but I think... until... Drew... I what? think my my people, the the you know the Latinos, the women, whoever, um, I think we do ourselves a disservice when we villainize every white male for every single thing they do. I'm not disagreeing you with that. I'm not, disagree- I'm not disagreeing with you about that, but I'm saying like we're not going to have a rational conversation about this right now because we're not in a rational place. Yeah. I agree. So, like, and I'm sorry, but throughout history, white men are kind of usually the bad guys in the real of world. Of course, and I'm and absolutely so... not going to say that they're not that there's not right now a, a huge victimization on the part of white of white males against a lot of people. But I think that if we say that every single thing that involves white men doing well is somehow victimizing people, I, I just, I'm really afraid. I don't, I don't know. I agree with you that it's, 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 it's thrusting all of that onto a movie that's that's, the, that's basically yeah. uh, uh, like a movie like right. Ready Player One is probably a bit loaded because it's it, it's not built to be that. And it, to me, frankly, like again, I had no idea any of this was going on. I, I you know, I, I I I run with a very liberal progressive crowd that's very much of people that were you know make, you know a lot of different races a lot of different you know cultures and it seemed like it was pretty well received from everybody that I know and they just kind of took it as oh this is a dumb fun movie where a guy drives the car from Back to the Future and dodges King Kong you know like, well, that's, like that's, that's good to hear I'm glad to hear that yeah that, like that, I, that. I I didn't see the the liberal maybe it's different because I'm I'm talking to actual people and not people who are hiding behind their keyboard. <laughs> but like 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 I'm actually going out in the world and talking to my friends but like there didn't seem to be a low level of liberal outrage uh among again my extre- like I I'm friends with communists like I I have I have friends with oh, yeah, I, 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 oh look I I'm, I don't agree <laughs> with that I am not a I am not a communist but I have friends that I am basically even though I am a very progressive liberal person that I basically am a Republican compared to them. And, you know, they, none of them are like, oh, Ready Player One, you know, gosh, you know, you know, that's, that's, I don't know, like, a, 
I, I guess I'm kind of, you know, where I'll meet Julie on this is like, that doesn't seem like it'd be an appropriate thing that I'd be outraged about when there's so much more to be out, I guess, outraged. Yeah, I mean, for me, I saw when my friends were critiquing it, again, I am biased because I know Ernie. But like I said, I, I, I had to tell him the Ernie I know um, is a fairly just a good dude. He wrote a book where he put himself in it and it had all the stuff. To me, it's it's just... Ernie. If I had any yeah. problems with the book, I think that the lead character, that Wade in the book is just too good at everything. Whereas usually you have like a group of nerds and one's good at, you know, memorizing every movie. Quote, and that's one's kind good of the way games. the movie came off. Yeah, like yeah. The movie, the movie kind, kind of skills. changes a little bit of that. But I, I thought that a lot of my friends had valid points. And I think, again, there are ways to change this, especially in this post-Gamergate world where i mean i used i haven't been part of the games industry in a while but i definitely saw a bunch of stuff where i was like man i am kind of not i'm not sad i'm not in games because so many assholes in the world gamergate people were atrocious it was awful but you know i i i always just until i saw some of these think pieces i was like well it's i mean you're kind of with it or or not um but I, 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 like I said, I thought some of it was valid, but it, I, again, going back to like it if you like it. And if you don't, I mean, it is just a, a nerdy dude's nerdy adventure. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 I like it. least, least this turned, uh, turn into our, our, our bonus episode where we review Ready Player One, which I yeah, didn't know what we did. So, um, well, I, 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 we did. Um, I will. I will. I'm going to cut off my my own comments right here and say that I enjoyed the movie. I think as a it, the heart, particularly horror fans who w- would get a lot out of it because of a lot of the, you know, there's there's King Kong, there's the T Rex from Jurassic Park, there's a whole scene that takes place in The Shining, there's Freddy, there's Chucky, there's Jason. So it's not just like sci-fi and superhero stuff being served up. Like it's it, it really does take a good crunch down on all the different types of flavor of geek that is out there you know so i enjoyed the movie i didn't realize there was a backlash um you know everybody is entitled to their feelings so you know that's cool i i i think we should give peace a chance and just let people enjoy whatever they're going to enjoy i'm done (laughs) Okay. Well, and I want to just before Jason, before you before you finish, um, I just want to say though that yeah, I'm with you about give peace a chance and let people enjoy what they're going to enjoy. I think it's per- perfectly legitimate for people to say what they find offensive and why, and I'm happy to hear that. And I'm just offering my response to that position because certainly there are any number of things where I'm getting all up in arms about something that other people aren't going to find offensive at all. And in fact, I've had. I have a really liberal friend on um, on Facebook who didn't call me out by name because he had enough people on his on his Facebook that were um, doing this as well. But he did have to he did address. He said, "Hey, uh, folks who are getting all upset about Roseanne, just cool it. We got bigger fish to fry." <laughs> and I'm just like, I think that was partly directed at me because I've definitely been like, I'm not watching that show. So, you know, there's definitely the things that I'm going to get upset about that other people, um, my husband included, don't find to be remotely worth getting upset about. So it's not that I don't think that um, people can have, that every, I don't, it's not that I think everybody just needs to chill out and just let people enjoy whatever they want to enjoy. We get to, we get to say when we find something offensive and, and even if we don't think it should even exist, um, I just don't happen to feel that way about this film. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think we will get that point back to that point at a, as a culture when yeah. Trump is gone. Like, I, I, I think that, I, think that, I really, I really that. firmly believe that. <laughs> like, I think we get rid of him and we'll start to get back to a more normal and frankly more productive dialogue as a society. I, I, yeah. I, I think the heightened state of um, just... You know, anger anger gets stuff done, and it's great, but I think, you know, what really is going to, you know, come November, I think we went, if we can apply that anger to vote and get the this rabid dog kind of back on a chain. Um, yes, I did just compare Donald Trump to a rabid dog. I'm not going to apologize <laughs> for that. Um, I think we'll start having a more productive uh, dialogue about this stuff. Um mm-hmm. 
And, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a section of, because uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, over the last year about the state of the world, and I'm sure there's probably going to be somebody saying that we're getting too political, and we certainly don't try to turn the podcast into that. But we're all very left-leaning people for the most part and from varying degrees on this podcast. So I, I, you know, there's going to, you know, we're going to discuss things the way we're going to discuss them, I guess. Um, Tony, make us stop talking about this. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was trying to hit it back that way. I, I do try to stay fairly apolitical. Um, my, I have two endorsements. A, Jason, the most weird Wednesday-esque movie I think I've seen. I watched on a lark. I've been sick. I haven't been sleeping at all. So I just watch yeah. weird random movies. Uh, uh, on Amazon Prime, if you have yeah. it, streams for free, Encounters right. with the Unknown, uh, uh-huh. narrated by Rod Serling. It's basically like three almost urban legends-esque things written partially by this guy, Jack Anderson, who wrote uh, things like, um, he was a columnist who wrote, a really fascinating guy, uh, reading through his uh, Wikipedia page. And he also, you know, did things like... Um, I'm trying to think of his filmography. I want to say like, you know, unsolved mysteries and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, it's fascinating, but it's basically three tales that are supposedly um, true, but you know, probably aren't. Uh, (laughs) I'm looking it up. 1973. This is, yeah, they reference, you know, they reference uh, a psychologist who are, I don't think is really um, a real person. (laughs) if i if it's noted um and it's pretty interesting it feels very i mean it's very of a time it feels like something we'd watch at weird wednesday and i'm surprised it never showed at weird wednesday i'm sure if they had a print it, it would have um but it was a fascinating oh, funny. just strange movie uh to watch and if um if, for people who don't know there was a for a long time it's still going but it started as a way to show all these random prints that um, Tim League and had found, um, and they would show these at midnight on Wednesday because nobody was coming, and they had a good deal on pizza and stuff. And Jason and I would always go from the outset back in what ninety eight, ninety seven. I I don't know. It was anyway, it was and that's yeah. what you know. That's what started the weird Wednesday thing. This feels like that. Um, I highly recommend it's just a strange oddity of 70s you know filmmaking with you know narrated by rod serling so that's cool too that's what kind of just took the chance now I, now yeah. amazon's recommending me all these weird like strange off-kilter uh similar movies and that's kind of cool i'm also gonna go with uh shout factory is Dot com shopfactorytv.com is now streaming Ultraman Leo, which I know Ultraman shows tended to be for a younger crowd, and I'm guessing that they were kids. This one might have been a kid show, but <laughs> it begins with Ultra 7, if I'm not mistaken, getting the crap kicked out of him, Ultraman Leo almost dying. There's an episode where some kids watch several people get cut in two. <laughs> like, Golly. At, like with torsos kind of mostly off camera um a a guy uh with a cigarette like a hero character by the way cigarette teaches tries to get this other monster creature who makes a fake cigarette (laughs) and starts smoking so i don't know it's just so vastly different Hmm. from american kids tv shows um and it's ultraman so it's great but it is in some of the most insane training sequences the uh former ultraman trying to teach ultraman leo the human you know ultraman leo in his human form how to fight monsters and i i was telling a friend of mine I'm, i kind of wonder if he doesn't have just some weird training regimen ideas slash fetishes that he's actually <laughs> just calling the monsters to earth so that he can tell no no Get on this wire and just spin around a lot. Like, just do that. You know, this is totally going to help you fight monsters. You should you should do this. Here, dodge these rocks or boomerangs or whatever <laughs> crazy crap. But I have been thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying Ultraman Leo. It's such a weird, if, if kaiju stuff and Sentai stuff and old, you know, 80s insanity from Japan is your bag. You can watch it for free which you used to not be able to do. Um, I'm I'm totally down. Ultraman is, uh, which by the way, talking Ready Player One, the 
Gundam rules where they're like they couldn't put Ultraman in Ready Player One, so the Gundam has two minutes to do its thing. It's that's Ultraman has mm. two minutes to do his thing in the Ultraman shows. So that that hit out of the park for me. There was like Godzilla music playing while a Gundam was fighting Mecha Godzilla with Ultraman rules in play. That that hit all my geek buttons at that moment. Um, for that, but yeah, I, I Ultraman Leo. Also, all the rain, like as I've said before, the Power Ranger shows that are on there are fantastic. Just weird, cool, crazy stuff to watch. Um, and you can binge all of it for free with ads, which is awesome. So I've, I've awesome. really come across to thinking that Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime Video is at this point, I think, superior in many ways. Maybe maybe head to head, this is a much bigger conversation, but superior in many ways to YouTube. I mean, sorry, to uh, Netflix, because Originally, Netflix was about the long tail, and Netflix has completely abandoned the idea of the long tail. They're only right. going for super popular stuff, new stuff. So the yeah. idea of where are you going to find all these old curios, which generally I'd much prefer to spend my time watching, because watching something old, you find new inspiration for new art. Uh, and so a grungy 1973 uh, you know, anthology film hosted by you know, uh, by a late career Rod Serling. That's like, mwah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's why I was like, what? This exists? I can't sleep. I'm coughing and trying not to feel like I've been hammered with rubber mallets. I'm staying up to watch Encounter with the Unknown. I was pleasantly surprised. Heck yeah. And then followed that, of course, like I said, with Ultraman Leo, where I and, and Amazon's where it's at, because they'll recommend... Like, you know, very But you cool, still have like... to pay for a lot of stuff on Amazon. That's yeah, my even... only real issue. You pay for the service. Or at least with Netflix, you, you get everything and you don't have, you're not slapped with all these extra well, charges. But, yeah, but, but another way, though, Netflix has a lot less stuff. I, there's stuff that it's tr- they would... I, I can't fault you on that. I don't disagree with no. you on that. And I actually think a lot of, I feel like Amazon's original movies. The ones that they put up are often better than the original movies that that um uh, that Netflix does. And it, with, with the original TV say. shows, they're about neck and neck. I but, got no complaints about Netflix's original TV shows anyway. I, but I'm just saying that like. Amazon, I've had much more fun in the last year and a half, couple years, with Amazon suddenly saying, hey, here's a late 60s serial killer movie from Great Britain that that Peter Cushing was in that you've never heard of. That only happens on Amazon. And it'll oh, be free. Absolutely. Included with Prime. But you're, you're right. Netflix, you know, a lot of times, uh, if we specifically go looking for it, chances are it costs three bucks. That's the that that is my rule of thumb. If I have well, to, so look I don't it up, mind. I don't mind doing that. You know, like a lot of the times, I just wish there was something that was kind of in between yeah. Amazon and Netflix, where it's like, hey, we specialize in old movies. Like, like why can't Turner Classic Movies get into the in the into the streaming business? There's a few of those, but in general, like again, because of the way it works, there's not. 500 kung fu movies on netflix now there might have been a, you know a lot of them at one point there's not because i saw encounters with the unknown it's not recommending all these weird um <laughs> almost in search of style yes. things from the 70s um random commercials for toys yeah. just it, amazon has gotten super weird you have to dig for it a little bit or you have to have weirdly specialized tastes which drives rain crazy because now our its suggestions are just like yeah. really <laughs> like how can i find anything because all of your suggestions are suggesting like warlords of the wasteland yes you know instead of like i don't know hallmark movies or whatever yeah speaking like, as a like, guy with finding, some really finding stuff taste. has become yeah. really hard on amazon because his suggestions are clearly aimed at me mm-hmm. and not even necessarily me but a weird pseudo me that is more obscure than even i am <laughs> yeah but it, with, between that and shop factory tv like those are the two channels i i'll hit netflix to watch you know, things I'm going to watch, but the, the most played on my Roku are definitely Shop Factory TV and Amazon Prime these days. Yeah. But we've had, we've, I think we've veered far off. No, no, we're, this is the endorsement <laughs> period. And I, I think it, I think it's definitely, it's definitely worth discussing. By the way, well, we uh, have the Ready Player One mini, mini episode. <laughs> well, Drew, you, your, your question was, hey, how come Terminator, uh, Turner Classic Movies doesn't do it? Good question. Warner, Time, Time Warner tried it, and uh, they created their own streaming service that was 10 bucks a month called Warner Archive. 
And uh, I had a subscription to Warner Archive for the Tiki book and because it's the only place to get Hawaiian Eye. And they've actually, in the last couple months, have declared that they are ending their service in a couple of months. Oh, man. They've switched it all over to Filmstruck. But here's what Ooh, sucks. Filmstruck is pretty good there. Filmstruck is wonderful. And and so they just moved my, you know, my, so my subscription will run out in August. Whatever. Great. But here's the thing. I was explaining this to a friend. They've moved uh, their library over to Filmstruck, but only the good stuff. So, like, if I, if I want to see, you know, little known musical Hit the Deck or whatever it is, or Hawaiian Eye, or, uh, you know, Club Meds, you know, uh, starring Bill Maher or whatever, or Bill Maher, any of any of those like cheesy things that were just in their back catalog that they had kind of shoveled into this service, those things are orphaned once again. And so so they tried their experiment and, and for whatever reason, according to their terms, they failed. So they're going to quit. Um, and that's interesting. I don't know what's going to happen with that stuff. So for a brief moment, a couple of years, I guess, we had access to shows like Hawaiian Eye and Surfside 6. And uh, now we don't, once again. I, you know, it's, it's sad. Dude, I would so. be happy just to be able to watch Get Smart. Without Get Smart, uh, you, you sure that Get Smart's not available anywhere? There's no... It's on, it's on Prime, but it's like 20 bucks. I like... wonder if any of the uh, ultra-high... Uh, channels or, or like the OTA channels like like 20 anyway whatever I, let me take that as an experiment I'll see if I can find if I can, you can find, find me get smart. smart I will declare you Saint Henderson all right then <laughs> I just I just finished uh actually binge watching all of the new Gidget which was the 1980s reboot of uh the you know the 1950s movie Gidget this was supposedly about Gidget grown up but and I had to watch it on a bootleg that I got from some guy on eBay um and uh and I'm glad that I did I have, I have no apologies about that that I didn't watch watch all of the all of the episodes of that but that's not even my endorsement because how could I endorse something that you will never ever be able to find unless you like meet this guy from eBay under a bridge somewhere and like say can you give me a bootleg and they were bootlegs off of somebody's like VHS <laughs> Like, like one episode, I finished watching one of the DVDs. It's like four hours of Gidget, like taped off of some New York channel. And then it goes off and there was like the last 10 minutes of Star Wars. Like somebody had. I got, I got so much amusement that they had the commercial for Ghostbusters cereal, though. Yes. Yes. I posted that on, on our thing because there was a point where they were eating Ghostbusters cereal because it was like whatever, 1986. And for whatever reason, Ghostbusters cereal was still being served. Uh, I yeah. I love Ghostbusters cereal, as you can might imagine. Uh, it, it, yeah. <laughs> no way. Yeah. No yes way. way. My my uh, endorsement. Yeah. <laughs> very briefly, my endorsement is a podcast from the Onion, from the Onion, and it is called a very fatal murder. It is a fake parody. Uh, well, it's a real parody. It's a fake um, <laughs> podcast like like uh uh serial so if you're into like true crime multi-part podcasts that like find a murder and go deep into who in the town did it and why and gather larger themes about knowing things and whether the whether whether you know industrial america and the rust belt and the gig economy and the death of religion and whatever this is a hilarious hilarious recreation of all of those things it is wonderful uh, and it's called a very fatal murder it's in like i think six parts you can listen to it on stitcher uh, it's from the onion but it's a it pretends to be from npr and it is wonderful so uh and so check that out that is our discussion of frenzy and everything else happening in our culture and ready, play, ready player one and ready player one <laughs> I, i'm i'm super duper excited that we... i think this may have been a record we, this may be a record for the longest episode i'm not sure oh this is a long yeah, episode. Is. i think uh the creep show episode was probably our longest episode uh <laughs> and um and I can't even explain why, but it, it, it was. So, gosh. Anyway, uh, thank you guys for being on. I'm so excited uh, that we got to discuss this. If you are listening, please come to the Facebook page and let us know what you think and engage with us. And, and we really love having those conversations. You can tell us we, that you think that we're either horrible right-wing uh, yeah. fascists or no-good pinko liberals. 
communists. Yeah. Out. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. I'm sure, um, I'm sure I'll get a little of both. We'll ra wave the red banner. And, and uh, so tell your friends, have them listen, leave reviews on iTunes. Seriously, leave reviews because that helps people find the show, honestly. Uh, thank you very much. We will talk to you later. We'll be back, I believe, next week, unless there's something that we're not aware of. Um, so have a fantastic evening, everybody. Good night. Good night.